Hello all, I'm Kel Kidman and welcome to Breaking on the Daily, where today we begin with Parlor is back, and to commemorate such an occasion, Parlor's logo will be in the, it, right in the video, you know, embedded, you'll see it, I think actually on this side uh, is where you're going to see it. Uh, it, just to commemorate the occasion, and I'm probably going to vacillate back and forth between using Minds and Parlor for the time being uh, going forward, depending on which I decide to long-term use more often. Uh, essentially, what I'm going to be putting there is where I'm going to be putting my random thoughts more often. I, I haven't quite decided that as of yet. And I, it's back, you know, it, it's up, and it is functioning, kind of. But, as with most web launches, it's not exactly working super well. <laughs> it's been down most of the day for me, though I did get in uh, for long enough to actually post my video from yesterday up on that website. So that was a good thing, and I do quite like Parler. And there are a lot of detractors in going, uh, going on around this, because more the story than simply the fact that it is back up, which is a good thing and a win for alt tech. I want to talk about more of the controversy surrounding Parler, and there's a few of them. Uh, to start off with, we can start with the easiest one to just utterly decimate, and that is the whole hacking thing. Because if, for those of you who remember when Parler actually went down back uh, around a month or two, uh, uh, more than a month ago, uh, I think at this point, just about a month ago, there was claims that Parler was hacked and a bunch of personal data got out into the, into the public because a uh, hacker got a hold of it. Yeah, that's not true because, to be frank, what, what happened, though it was a stance, uh, done by someone who is a self-proclaimed hacker, was not a hack. At least not in any sense that would make uh, any sort of logical through point. I mean, the equivalent of what they did is the same sort of thing I do for all my videos to have all these archived links in the description that you can click and that you can look at the original st uh, some of the stories that I researched for this video that I find to be a good jumping off point. Those links down below are essentially what they did. And now, they, I'm fairly sure, downloaded it directly onto their computers rather than using a service like archive.org, though they could have used archive.org, I have no idea, or something along those lines. But they didn't get any private information. All they got was a bunch of publicly posted parlays that were on the site publicly that anyone could access if they had a parlor account. That's not a hack. <laughs> I, 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 so... You see a lot of parlors detractors doing this, and this includes people who are on, uh, you know, sort of the alt text side, but have their dog in the fight with some uh, people on Minds and Gab both making this claim uh, ineptly <laughs> at, at that. But you also have more of this because there's been a bit of infighting, particularly among the microblogging sort of uh, alt text sites. You don't see it as much among video sharing websites, mostly because video sharing is more of a uh, you can do it multi platform. Like I do, I upload consistently to four, four websites, though I have like six or seven where I have an account and can upload. I just don't bother most of the time. Uh, and so uh, video sharing as a general rule is less of an exclusive deal than something like microblogging is. Because with microblogging, you don't really want to have to deal with multiple platforms. You don't want to have to vacillate between using Minds and Gab and Parler all at the same time. And you really only want to post your thoughts in one area. And so what ends up happening, uh, I see this more among the microblogging space with, with things like Minds and Gab and Parler, is that they... Uh, People who use Minds, or people who use Gab, or people who use Parler are very tribal about using that particular platform. And I don't really get it, because all of these platforms have their advantages and disadvantages, uh, with Gab's advantage being the user interface being quite good and having particular features that I uh, quite like, and also just being consistently there for a lot of this thing, and being able to more easily avoid... Uh, objectively profane things like uh, pornography and that sort of stuff. Mines has the advantage of being consistently the most stable of all of these platforms. I've never really had any slowdowns on Mines, and I also quite like Mines in that it has more functionality to be more along the lines of a Facebook than something like a Twitter, where Twitter is just a bunch of words on the screen, whereas on Mines you can do groups and that sort of stuff, so you have that sort of extra functionality, and you also have functionality for actual video uploads, which is a nice thing. And that's one of the places where I usually put my videos. And for Parler, what the advantage was, in my opinion, 
was its actual mass market appeal. Because unlike Gab or Mines, uh, particularly Gab, Gab is, uh, Mines is le has less of this problem, Parler's culture wasn't super alienating to a whole lot of people. And what this uh, congealed in is that a lot more, more mainstream conservatives ended up migrating to Parler in much larger numbers than some uh, than places like Gab or Mines. Because places like, uh, particularly Gab, has a very serious political sort of thing, and it is, it, they do have a lot of people who are really dumb on Gab. Uh, there's a lot of quite popular people on Gab who still support things like QAnon and, the, and that sort of thing. The utter insanity of that at this point. I, 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 yeah, just for the QAnon people to briefly mention you. You guys are idiots. You, you fell for a, for a sham. You fell for something that, for all we know, was a freaking deep state operation. And you did that for years, and you still are doing it. It doesn't make sense. I, I, for all of you who are still in it, stop. Just stop. Okay, uh, it, just to acknowledge you briefly. But one of the controversies around Parler, which sort of comes to this sort of culture thing, is that uh, the former CEO, John Matze, I, I, I can't quite pronounce his last name, was fired from the company in the middle of this whole thing. And there is a back and forth going on about why this sort of thing happened and what the, the culture of the company is going to be going forward. And, I don't know, uh, Parler hasn't substantially changed their user agreement. I actually looked through it uh, uh, today when it was up and I could see it. And I also looked through their community guidelines and things seem to be pretty much exactly the same as they were before. No illegal content, no spamming or bots. Uh, that's essentially what Parler's always been, and that's what it seems to remain to be at this point. But, John Matze, uh, on his exit, it seemed to be a quite bitter one where he's now claiming that the company is going to bend to political correctness or something to that effect, whereas the company is actually claiming the exact opposite, that essentially John Matze was doing something else to essentially that effect, where they, it, it, it's kind of unclear over what is exactly being alleged, and I, there aren't a lot of details, so I have no idea, but both sides essentially seem to be claiming that they are pro-free speech, are the pro-free speech thought aside of this argument, and it's kind of undiscernible as to which is accurate. So I'm not going to make a whole lot of assumptions on that point, but I think there might be another reason, because Parler went under a huge redesign, and I'm going to be frank, it's not very good. It's so close to Twitter that I just can't like it. Because I don't really like Twitter's design uh, in a web context anyway. I think that it doesn't leave enough room for the tweets and has this huge uh, space taken up by your profile on the side. It doesn't make sense. But it's it, it, on that note, it's kind of funny that at this point, with the combination of Parler's design sense and uh, Gab's uh, aesthetic sensibilities, if you put the two together, you essentially have a carbon copy of Twitter with, uh, between the both of them, with uh, Parler taking many design cues from how Twitter uh, arranges its design with the access to your profile on the left and then the trending stuff on the right with the uh, tweets and, uh, or parlays in the middle with Gab taking a lot of visual design aspects and uh, art style from Twitter. If you can't see that, I, I think you're blind. It's, it's pretty clear that they're quite similar, but certain other things being quite different, such as how the actual uh, Gabs are laid out and how the actual screen is laid out with everything that is not the Gab itself on the right side, you know, it, it, it's that sort of thing. And it's interesting how that works, because Minds doesn't seem to really have that problem. I mean, it looks similar to Facebook, but it has its own design sensibilities and doesn't seem to be a carbon copy, unlike what these two platforms are doing. And I'm going to be frank, I like the original design of Parler better. And if I'm being honest, I have a sneaking suspicion that this redesign had a whole lot more to do with John Nancy's exit than anything else. And the reason being is that this redesign and the redesigned logo that they put out only happened 
after he left the company. Before, and this, I'm talking like within a day. Within a day, the logo, uh, uh, if you went to the parlor updates page, had already changed. Whereas before, it was the normal parlor logo. So I, I have just sneaking suspicion that this was the linchpin. <laughs> I don't know why that I necessarily think this, other than that it seems to line up timeline-wise, and uh, m both sides' uh, uh, narrative on the point don't seem to line up or really make a whole lot of sense, especially since they're both essentially claiming the exact same thing of the other party. So it, it, it's quite funny in that, in, in that respect. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, you know, people have problems of, of this sort for all, all, all sorts of platforms. Uh, people have this problem with Gab, like the fact that it doesn't allow porn, which I don't know why you care that much. It, mines it, culture kind of has this thing where they, where they don't like Gab pretty much because it doesn't allow porn. And it's like, dude, you can't go streaking in the public square. I'm not going to complain and whine about the fact that they don't let that sort of thing on Gab, especially since porn as an industry is kind of a op it's kind of opening yourself up to vulnerabilities because there's so much that is at least borderline that's hard to actually measure, especially when you're trying to keep illegal stuff off your off your website to prevent yourself from getting shut down. So I, I understand Gab's perspective on the matter, particularly on a moral level, as I tend to agree with them on a moral level. And it's just not an issue I seem... I have a huge issue with either way. I mean, I, I can just avoid it on mines, and so I don't really care about it. And on Gab, it's like, it's whatever. It's not actually limiting free speech. It's limiting particular forms of ob objectively obscene speech, which is, by the way, the point of Section 230 in the first place. So I have no problem with that. And I don't get why people freak out about it. Though I have seen Andrew Torpa kind of spurg out in the opposite direction. So, yeah, I get I get not liking Andrew Torpa as a person. He, he does seem to be more of the spurgy type than a lot, a lot of other people. Uh, or, or how you'd want him to be. But, yeah. It, 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 you can't expect perfection. But it is kind of my opinion there. And moving on to a kind of update on the GameStop story. The Wall Street Journal has done a puff piece talking about particular people who bet big on the GameStop stop, uh, stop stock and lost big. And this is the sort of thing that you would obviously expect from this sort of story because there's always the incredibly stupid and uh, pe uh, people who cannot look forward even five seconds in their lives who are going to do stupid things through investments. This sort of thing is inevitable. Inevitably, as the market rises or falls, there will be losers. That's just the nature of how the market is and how investment works. You're taking a risk, and so if that risk did not, you know, sometimes result in a loss... It wouldn't be a risk, and you wouldn't, in all likelihood, gain any sort of value out of it. So these sort of puff pieces are really vapid and mass It just, I don't like how they frame a lot of this sort of stuff. Now, this piece kind of surprised me in that some of these stories don't seem to be directly taking jabs at the GameStop stock movement in general, it, it seems to me that some, a, a lot of these people are actually fairly chill about it, saying, yeah, I, I kind of expected to lose on this. And But there are also, you know, your fair share of incredibly stupid stories of people taking out $20,000 loans and putting it in at $200, which is about eh, $100 or more above where the stock really should be. You know, and this kind of explains why I never got in on the GameStop thing. I, I never bought into it, and the reason is is because I did not get in before the point where I thought it was going to, you know, essentially rise anymore. I, I essentially saw it being, this thing is so high, it has to come down eventually, the economic gravity does exist and cannot be avoided, well, it can be avoided for a certain amount of time, but as with normal gravity, only for so long, eventually it does have to come down to the ground. And whether that ends in a crash or a safe landing is really up to this particular investor and how well they take advantage of this particular state of uh, being. And I 
got, uh, when I found out about the GameStop thing, it was already up at like 150. <laughs> it was already really high and much higher than I would have ever bought into GameStop stock. So I didn't buy into it. And the reason I didn't, it, it, I think that's fairly self-explanatory as a reason for not buying into it. There's no reason for me to buy into something which I don't believe is actually worth that much. And this isn't to say I'm not, you know, in favor of the people who were doing this sort of stuff, just that I was not in necessarily the financial position to throw away money at that sort of thing. And I'm still not, frankly. I, I don't intend to do that sort of stuff. I, I, plus, I prefer to invest in uh, currency things. I, I, I like doing that sort of stuff rather than stocks. It's just personal preference. I, I, and there's nothing really, you know, it, I, I'm not going to begrudge anyone who goes into stocks or anything. You know, I just prefer going into investing crypt uh, currencies and, like, cryptocurrencies and that sort of stuff. Because I find it more interesting. Uh, I find it more interesting than stocks. And also more uh, actually uh, available to the, like, market. And, and, and I, I see it as being more information-based rather than being based on literally nothing. And, yes, that includes Bitcoin, st uh, Bitcoin which is super influenced by hype it, it, like it's insane but even then i think it's i think it's less of a lottery and more of a information gathering thing than than stocks are but that's just my opinion of the subject to move on to our next story Qu cuomo andrew cuomo governor andrew cuomo of new york has blamed the toxic political environment amid his scandal of not counting nursing home deaths properly and killing grandma over a three or four month period back in around March to May. And uh, this particular press conference of which this article speaks, it's filled with a lot of gems because a lot of really dumb things were said during this press conference. Like, for instance, he said that people who, uh, the legislator that was contemplating taking away his emergency powers, that even contemplating doing that sort of thing was somehow criminal, which really makes him sound like the sort of uh, Palpatine type. Uh, and yes, I stole this sort of thing from Twitter because that's where I originally saw it. And yeah, I saw that on Twitter. I, I love that comparison. It, it is actually quite apt as uh, that's sort of what Palpatine was doing in Revenge of the Sith. Though I understand cliche movie uh, reference, well, it, notwithstanding, it, I find it to be quite the funny comparison. Because Andrew Cuomo has really been treating this whole thing with such, you know, a, I don't want to say a deft touch because it's not very deft. But at the same time, it's shown that he is a very seasoned liar. Because some of the things he has blamed this whole thing on is he has spun this whole narrative in this press conference that the only problem that New York had was a, quote, information void. That essentially, the reason that all of these people were saying so many mean things about Andrew Cuomo is because he wasn't releasing enough information out. Because, oh, we couldn't get out and debunk all of this disinformation and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> all the while ignoring the fact that he was under-reporting the nursing home deaths. And he waves this away as saying, no, 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 our, per our reporting was perfectly accurate. All we did was we were a bit late on reporting it. Because in N Andrew Cuomo land, there's no such thing as a lie by omission. And you know, that's kind of a reasonable assumption to make when your brain is so addled on CNN coverage and being on, uh, on with uh, Chris Cuomo doing a comedy act, essentially, that that sort of thing might seem uh, almost entirely, and not only reasonable, but any other position might be, even seem unreasonable to these sorts of people. But of course, when we exit that sort of bubble and we start getting into, you know, people who actually subsist their thoughts and uh, opinions of what truth and falsehood are to reality and not some fantasy land where uh, lies by omission don't exist, it starts kind of falling apart. Because they added 50% on top of what was already there, uh, it essentially doubled it, the number of deaths that were had in the nursing homes. And his best response to this is, well, some of the people who were there were already sick. 
Really? His best response to this is, yeah, but they were already there in the first place, and then we sent more to them. Because that's always a good idea. Yeah, because if we want to have people get less sick, you know, and not infect as many people, we really want to send a whole bunch of sick people in that direction. You know, we definitely want to send all these sick people over into this group of healthy people so that they can all get infected. <laughs> that's what we want to do. I, I, I mean, it just displays the utter incompetence of Andrew Cuomo in this instance, because what he should have been doing, assuming that what he said is accurate and not just a complete bald-faced lie, was the exact opposite of what he did in reality, which is taking out the people who are sick and putting them into the hospital. You know, normal pandemic response. Because it turns out that when people get sick in a pandemic, historically, they go to the hospital. They separate themselves, particularly from other vulnerable people. And in terms of nursing homes, oh man, that's A1 territory for a dangerous virus uh, to those sorts of people, like the coronavirus. So why exactly was Andrew Cuomo sending them to there? Well, I think this is a question that can be aptly answered through this next story, which is Harris commenting on the White House uh, COVID vaccine plan and contradicting Fauci by saying that they are going to start from scratch. And what this article speaks of, and what it speaks to more broadly in a narrative point, is that everyone in government, or at least most people in government, are obsessed with doing something. And this isn't a novel idea, all right? P people in government have been obsessed with doing things for a very long time. But the idea of a very active government, as we have had over particularly the past year, is something which, at least for the time being, has proved that socialism has won the battle, if not the war. Because the whole idea of a socialistic government is the idea that the government is going to take an active response, and uh, by the government I mean the state or the public, is going to take an active response to every aspect of society that is going to take active control over those aspects and dictate to the rest of, uh, of the people who exist what shall be done. That is the concept of socialism, uh, essentially government control of the means of production, and also government control over everything in your life. That's what ends up happening under socialism, definitionally. And these sorts of government figures, like Kamala Harris, who wants to take a national response to the vaccine, or like Andrew Cuomo, who insists on responding and doing something about the COVID-19 pandemic in his state, and overreacting to it, assuming that certain things would happen when there was little to no evidence, in reality, that they would happen. Is evidence that they would, that it would happen, evidence, essentially uh, equates to models. Things that predicted into the future what might potentially happen if all of the assumptions of the researchers are correct, and they are accurately representing exactly what's happening in reality right now. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. That sounds like a good reason to preemptively move a grandma into her, her nursing home rather than having her in a sick ward where she's not going to be in danger of getting other grandma sick and potentially putting more lives in danger. I've never been one to claim this pandemic is an incomplete hoax because it's fairly clear that some sort of disease called COVID-19, does exist, and that it has killed people over the past year. I have never been of the position that the disease is entirely made up, or made up at all. It's simply not. However, I have been of the position that much of the scientific establishment, government establishment, and many other aspects of our society have spent the past year 
both overplaying the virus to make it seem as though certain aspects and certain responses are more justified than they actually are. And they have been spending all of their time to that point and to that purpose. I also believe that many in the medical establishment and scientific establishment have been pushing nonsense and have been pushing models and other completely inaccurate and non-representative ways of studying things in order to easily manipulate the narrative surrounding any sort of data on the actual virus itself. Take the Germany study that I've brought up a few times in the past, for example. That study is purely designed to justify Germany's use of a mask mandate. It exists for no other reason, and every single aspect of that study is geared toward proving a point. It is not geared toward discovering anything. If it was, it would have actually provided a counterfactual that existed in reality rather than inventing one out of whole cloth using their own assumptions as the way to create such a counterfactual. They would not have done that. But they did. And the reason they did, and as I hope I've clearly established, is to make it easier for everyone to swallow the sort of hogwash that we're getting out of much of the medical establishment, out of all of this sort of COVID response. That, that is the purpose of that study. That's why people will bring it up and refuse to even criticize it at all, because the only way you could criticize it at all is to criticize the entire political science establishment. Is to criticize most political sciences, and I don't mean political science in the you know major sense, the the political science, uh, the science of politics. I mean sciences that are with regard to public policy and pol uh, political policy. Those are the sorts of sciences that I'm talking about. That entire industry relies on using faulty methods fundamentally pseudoscientific methods to get past the idea that the government and what they're doing is justified. That's why they exist. That's why they continue to exist. And that's why no one criticizes them by and large, unless they're going up against the orthodoxy, unless they're going up against the government and what the government wants to push at this very moment. That's why they... Uh, all these sorts of studies that come out, every single mass study is either a very controlled, non-representative lab study that isn't long-term and doesn't represent the actual conditions in, in the wild and doesn't even accurately uh, measure filtering particles even in its own context because it is purely directional and doesn't actually measure the filtering capabilities of the mass, but rather it's deflector, uh, deflecting capabilities. Or it's a model where it's assumed that masks work from the outset. That's why those are the only two sorts of studies that exist, because those are the only two sorts of studies that they could possibly skew to look like, they're, uh, like masks are a useful thing. That's why it exists. And I hope I've made that my, my point on this clear, as I've made this point many times, and I will continue to make it until every single person on this earth has heard it <laughs> because it needs to be heard and it needs to be known that these sorts of things are nonsense not only nonsense but pseudoscience of the highest order because they are accepted by the medical establishment because the the scientific establishment because the people who are supposed to be our scientific betters refuse to call it out because of its influence and its connections in society. That's why. That's why I will continue to talk about it until the day's end. And that's where I'm going to leave us off. You know, uh, wherever you are, subscribe. Unless you're on YouTube, in which case subscribe literally anywhere else. There's plenty of links in my description. Uh, I've already talked about the four uh, video websites which I most regularly uh, post on that we... BitChute, YouTube, uh, Minds, and Brighteon, all of those four I regularly post to. I try, uh, I, I, I'm always trying to figure out how to make something like Odyssey work and Rumble. I don't hate Rumble, but Rumble's annoying, especially for someone like me who does current events because it takes like five days for things to get monetized and thus able to be shared out. So I, I, I don't find that platform to be particularly useful for that reason. So I, eh, I don't know. 
that, but that's my opinion on that. Uh, follow me on Gab and Ma and uh, Parlor. Actually, you now that it, it is back up, or you know, assuming that it's working tomorrow when this video comes out, and that's where I'm going to leave you guys today. This has been Breaking Out the Daily. I'm Kel Kidman, and I'm out.